the Arts, Parks, Health, Aging, and Los Angeles River Committee meeting. I am joined by my colleague, Curran Price, and we will soon be joined by our colleagues, Gil Cedillo and uh, Tom LaBunge. Uh, we are waiting to meet quorum, and so what I will do is start with item three and the presentation on the West Nile virus uh, report, especially since we have uh, a visual presentation uh, set up. If we're ready to go with that, we can go ahead and start with item three without objections. Hi, I'm Dr. I, Rachel Seven. I'm a medical hold on, hold on. epidemiologist. Okay. Let me read the and, yeah, Adam's going to read the, and we'll get the microphone in front of you as well. So motion, LaVange Fuentes, relative to requesting Los Angeles County Department of Public Health to report in regard to the impacts of West Nile virus on the city, protection methods against the virus, and how to spread awareness to the residents of the city. Oh, hi. I'm Dr. Sivan. I'm a medical epidemiologist, and I'm the lead uh, doctor in charge of uh, vector-borne disease, which our most important one is West Nile. So I've put together a relatively brief presentation, and I have a handout that I gave um, our councilmen up here, our surveillance report, which is posted every week on our website, so you can always um, access it easily. So um, let's look at West Nile. It's a very interesting disease. It's, uh, the, it's an important, it has a lot of ecological functions between mosquitoes, birds, and even other small, small mammals. And it survived, it's been here since 2000, the first case in 2003. We've seen cases every year. Um, and this, just looking at the cycle, uh, us humans and horses are called dead end hosts. That means we, we don't really transmit it to other people. Uh, other than potentially through blood donating, like through infected blood, but that's now screened. But your most important how you catch it is through an infected uh, mosquito. And um, I'm going to focus on what we call our surveillance, which is how we, we look at our cases and also how, our, how we work with what we call the mosquito abatement districts and they are extremely important for the control of mosquitoes and also surveillance. They, they actually give us our earliest warning signs. So um, West Nile and surveillance, we do, there's a lot of components involved between surveillance, which means looking for disease and we look for mosquitoes, specific species, and if they have evidence of being infected with the West Nile virus. We also, for the past uh, 70, 80 years, we've also been big in uh, what we call sentinel chicken surveillance, which there are chickens posted in about 100 locations in Los Angeles County that are not infected, and they are in... Uh, and we, their blood tests are measured on these to see if they're infected with West Nile. Now, these sentinel you chicken... Check, where, do you, where do you check these chickens? We check to see if there's evidence of West Nile infection. We where, docu where, do you, where do you get the chickens? That you check? Um, they're, I guess they're available commercially, and, and it's something, it's a very common way of um, looking for other uh, arbovirals, such as like eastern equine, western equine, St. Louis equine, diseases that we were more concerned about before West Nile. So it's continued to maintain, and the thing about these <coughs> mosquito pools and the sentinel chickens, you will see them before you have um, human disease. So when you start getting, when we start getting warnings, there's already infected mosquitoes. That means human diseases around the corner. Another form of um, the reason I ask is some of yeah. our some of our neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, you know, we got some chickens. Right? <laughs> you know, oh, chickens I just, for... I just wondered, was there a real grassroots effort to do a little oh, no, survey, or, or do no, you get it's the not major within... places out, out? No, these are special chickens. I'll show you another picture that are... There's actually a coop of them on our the top of the garage at 300 oh. North Figueroa that are maintained by the vector control. Mm -hmm. And they come in weekly, bi-weekly, do a blood specimen, and see what their conversions. So not Another random, not random chickens. These are chickens no. are some kind of control. Uh, no, these are special locations. I've got to ask because I, yeah. I got both. Yeah, of them. I know it's something kind of unique. <laughs> and then we have dead bird surveillance um, that 
mosquito abatement, veterinary public health. And then horses, horses rarely get sick now because there's a very effective horse vaccine. Um, and then, of course, our human testing, human cases, suspects are reportable by law. We also have a, agreements, laboratory tests are also reportable by law. Because sometimes doctors and nurses aren't always the best at reporting, but we have these agreements with laboratories. Mm -hmm. So we have a pretty good system in place. This is a picture of, what, of some of these chickens. Mm -hmm. And this is looking at what we call our West Nile virus surveillance report. And here, this report, we try to capture um, one of the important things is human case onset year by year. And you can see in uh, 2014 is in red, and then we're looking at 2013. And one of uh, the things that's kind of interesting, because of our weather is getting warmer and warmer, we see more cases even as far as with symptom onset into November. Mm -hmm. Some years as far out as Thanksgiving. But our biggest years are um, September, August and September, and sometimes a lot in October. What you have to realize, it takes from 3 to 14 days from when an infected mosquito well, um, from when the symptoms show up. So we're always actually in humans. We're kind of behind the time because it takes about two weeks. Mm -hmm. We share our human data with the vector control agents so they can target their mosquito abatement um, activities. So um, on your report, we our public health department is divided in districts and service planning areas which approximate the geography of Los Angeles County. And our biggest impacted areas every year are the warmer parts, especially those with warm evening temperatures, which would be San Fernando, San Gabriel, and the eastern part. However, with warmer temperatures, we're seeing West Nile in places we haven't seen in past years, like a lot of cases, 2013 in the South Bay, more cases in the Antelope Valley last year. So it's a pretty important that citizens know of the risk, especially in San Fernando and San Gabriel. Another thing you look on the map, we combine all our non-human data. The red is like the most hot spots for mosquitoes and sentinel chickens. Mm -hmm. So it pretty much corresponds with human. And every week we summarize our data. This is a summary from last year. Our cases, because of the clinical nature of this disease, m people are more affected as they get older. Most of our cases that are reported are hospitalized. And every year we have a number of people actually die from West Nile. What about what's that number m oh, on well, average? This year so far we've actually had four deaths. Four deaths yeah. in the county. And they are usually older folks from 80 plus. They usually die of encephalitis. You look at our cases this year, um, we've had 45 cases um, to date of encephalitis, which is a severe form of uh, global brain infection. Most of these people don't do well at all. And then you look at, we've had 51 cases of meningitis. They do pretty well. Most of them get better. 10 cases of acute flaccid paralysis, which is a pretty scary thing, a lot like polio. And these are all diseases brought on by, by West, West Nile, Nile virus. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll go over. Now, this is looking for 2013, and this is our case rate per 100,000. And you got to realize that these case rates are, de uh, we have a large denominator, 10 million people about in Los Angeles County. So overall, I mean, the numbers look small, but it does impact probably more than you think for parts of Los Angeles County. Let's look at just reviewing a bit on the clinical presentation, about 80%. And Doctor, before you go with that, let me just welcome uh, our colleagues Gil Cedillo and Tom Labonge. Okay. So I'm talking Thank about you. West Nile. Most cases are asymptomatic, about one in a five of West Nile, fi West Nile virus fever, which is, um, feels like you got the flu, uh, but it's in the summer and the fall, and there's usually no respiratory, but a lot of muscle pain, severe headache, and then less than 1% will be sick enough that they're so concerned they show up in an emergency room and hospital and will be hospitalized. So... Um, 
with the febrile illness, most have fever, headache, rash, and fatigue, and a small percent go have neuroinvasive disease. So the most important thing is always, it's important, but a lot of people, fortunately, will be asymptomatic. Febrile illness can actually last more than a few weeks. It can be prolonged with a lot of fatigue. Can you explain febrile? Oh, that means having a f uh, fever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of at least like 101.5. So, if, uh, uh, sorry, doctor speak. Uh, 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 West Nile virus fever. And I thought you were talking about care. <laughs> 101, you know, you got it. I guess you don't listen to care. <laughs> no. Okay, no. <laughs> NPR. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to let you know why I wanted this heard is so all our members get to hear this. And what I'd like to ask the CLA's representative here, CLA's representative, thank you, is maybe to break this down and prepare a report for full council that does articulate more by regions of our, maybe the, either the planning areas, the districts of our inside the city, outside the city. When you mentioned San Fernando, that hurts home to a lot of us who represent parts of the valley and, and where it could be as it's broken down. But I think it's more a benefit to all council members uh, that they hear this general report from the Los Angeles County Health Department. Right, because it's, San Fernando is critically important, but this year we've had cases in Beverly Hills. We've had cases in Santa Monica. We've had cases in PV. And uh, we used to, we thought we had a four-year cycle. Like every four years there was big years. But we've had three back-to-back -back cycles, 2012, 2013, and uh, now 2014, we're going to make about 165 cases, but you have to realize that most of these cases are the people, about 90% are people sick enough to be hospitalized. So there are probably a lot of people that have febrile illnesses. They're either not going to the doctor or the doctor might think about it, but unfortunately there is no treatment. So, so we have to do prevention, and we have to support the mosquito abatement districts, which Absolutely. is really important. So, Doctor, I don't know how much uh, more you have oh, on your report. Just a tiny bit more. But then we are going to have a few questions. Yeah, so, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So let's just go on to prevention and control. So one of the important things is the control within your neighbor neighborhood with your swimming pools being properly maintained, no standing water, um, and then... The mosquito abatements take care of larviciding and adulticiding. They try to focus on larviciding, which is at the egg level, instead of having the ground spraying, which is much, which is not acceptable to many neighborhoods. It's only done when it's really needed. So um, as far as our public health, like, we have to take care of the humans, so we have to we try to do what we can with residential habitat elimination. That means, like, keep your fountains in, in good working order. Don't leave a bunch of water out or rain collection. That's um, out where mosquitoes can breed. Your pool in, a, in working order. And uh, little containers catching the drippings of plants. Make sure they're over there. They, you turn them over and no water collects. And then we also is personal protection with wearing light, long sleeve clothing, repellent, and uh, appropriate and avoidance. And this is the biggest problems is we're talking people 50 and older because the risk factors are really age, immunocompromise is is really critical, and also having you know diabetes cardiovascular disease we're talking people really being hit hard even healthy people that are 50 50 plus and much more affected when you get to be 70 or 80 so um, our most popular and well established mosquito repellent are deep based from 10 to 35 percent mm -hmm. and then not be and they're very safe and a lot of information on our website and then we can just go to just something I'll pick up. Uh, just You may have heard that we have um, two new mosquitoes in the San Gabriel Valleys. Mm -hmm. And that's concerning Aedes albopictus, Aedes aegypti. And the San Gabriel Vector Control, in coordination with Los Angeles County uh, Mosquito Abatement, um, Greater Los Angeles, are doing the 
some of the mosquitoes cross their lines, are doing their best to really try to control them through educational, through ground spraying. And the concern is, you know, it, it is a, um, it will take a lot of probabilities coming in that these two mosquitoes can transmit both dengue and a infection that has hit the Caribbean and <coughs> Central America hard called chikungunya. And um, they are very capable. But a lot of things would have to coincide. You'd have to have someone returning from travel with a high <coughs> viral, <coughs> viral load there and mm -hmm. a lot of things. But who knows in the next what we could see. But we're on our alert. <coughs> My unit follows up on all these reports, checks where if these people have traveled. Because <coughs> it <coughs> would be a big public health emergency. Mm -hmm. So that's a picture. The mosquito has a really unique appearance. It's called the tiger mosquito, and it's different from our usual um, mosquito that transmit West Nile um, in that they're day biters, where the mosquito that transmits, we have a lot of mosquitoes that transmit West Nile. They, they really come out early in the morning, and when it's more comfortable out, dawn to dusk, where these are just supposed to be one of the most annoying mosquitoes very aggressive and bite during the day and a very you'd know and if you ever see it make sure you call your <coughs> mosquito abatement district mm -hmm. we don't have any in the in the los angeles area most of them are um, rosemead um, arcadia so hopefully they're working really hard that it will not go any further but they've been there four or five years and they haven't been mm -hmm. able to eradicate it so that's chikungunya. You may have heard it from the news or known people that may have come back from a West Indies vacation with very severe joint pain. It's not fatal, but just really uncomfortable, prolonged joint patient and pain. And then dengue is a febrile illness people get from Central America, Asia, India. So... Um, West Nile's our most common mosquito-borne disease in the U.S. It's also one of the most common causes of encephalitis, period, when, that you'll be able to find actually a cause. Um, we have West Nile here. It's not going away. We've had our first case in 2003. We have more areas than we've ever had. And uh, we're seeing it throughout the Americas. It will be really important that we have great relationships and support our mosquito abatement and, again, that we continue human surveillance. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We have a weekly report and educational materials. Um, and then there's also information from the state of California. They have an excellent website. Uh, with everything throughout California. It's not just Los Angeles. It's Sacramento. It's Fresno. It's a big California problem. It doesn't get as much press as Ebola, but probably because it's, it's mm -hmm. quite... Well, probably nothing, is, uh, nothing is getting as much press as Ebola. I mean, yeah. nothing under the sun these yeah. days. Uh, I have a but question. it does kill a lot. Sure. Tom, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank you for that. And at some time we work with the CLA to enhance the focus on our districts throughout the city and I think what you said about weather in the hotter areas, et cetera, and then also the regional challenge and Mr. Chair, we could uh, schedule with the clerk at some point soon and also get the word out. Let me ask you a question, Doctor. How many people passed uh, this weekend or in the last month from flu in Los Angeles County? Flu, we are still... I don't know the number. But, but is it more than five, more than ten, oh, you think? I think we're very few at this. I think we haven't really hit the start of the but year. Let's say last year. What oh, was the worst year. month? Oh, the what? I don't have all those at my fingertips, but I imagine the worst month would probably be around January. And that would be 25 there probably, people? There could be. You know, a lot of people die of flu, but it's not really diagnosed. Right. So it could be hundreds. hundreds. Right. Because the Mr. Chairman... Yes, sir. I'm just saying this whole Ebola challenge that we have, I mean, flu and other public health issues that are currently throughout the United States should be talked about more and be ready to not just kind of uh, pick on this challenge. Yes, we should do right. all we can to work 
on the issues that is affecting people, but there's other issues that they, right. I mean, I've heard more about Ebola in, uh, in one month than I've heard about flu in, uh, yeah, in 40 years. Yeah. People getting right. their vaccines, right. there's newer vaccines available, uh, more effective in older yeah. people. The other thing, too, I wanted to just stay to, mm -hmm. you know, standing water also is created sometimes because of street challenges, and we want to make sure our Board of Public Works, Kevin James, if you're listening, uh, is up to the queue on that because the street conditions sometimes cause water to pond and we should tell people to call 311, you know, so that they can report it and have a public campaign. So if you want to stand on a street corner with me, we'll uh, find one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure, and we'll open it, uh, the panel for questions as well. So, Doctor, thanks for your presentation. Really appreciate that. The first question I have is something that you mentioned last, and as you have a weekly newsletter that you publish. Oh, yeah, we have an update. Yeah, we have an update. How's that? Yeah, how's it? How is it accessible to the general it's public? It's accessible on the Los Angeles County Department Public Health website, and then you mm -hmm. go into the acute communicable disease control site, mm -hmm. and it's on there every single week. And then when West Nile, our season usually starts around July, and we have our last cases coming in. We're hearing about because it takes about two weeks and then the report. We finalize all our every totals and how everything went by January. So okay. you can get sort of an annual. And there's also just all kinds of things. We put out a um, acute communicable a annual report which summarizes every reportable disease, the number of cases, who it's affecting by age, by sex, race, ethnicity, some interesting facts about what we collect in our case reports. So we have that. We also have special reports, which are unique investigations that many do go on to publish. But just to mm -hmm. show you all the different things we do besides West Nile, between influenza, hospital outbreaks, skilled nursing facilities. Okay, and, and Doctor, just to add to that, can people subscribe and get the I, updates sent to them on a regular I basis? they can mm -hmm. I should have been prepared but I believe they mm -hmm. can okay yep, I'd have to I know you a lot of things you can't you can sub we also have there's also a weekly influenza letter which can mm -hmm. definitely be subscribed to it's very much like this but mm -hmm. even more national things going on but there is a weekly influenza alert and is that published uh, by, through my department by the county? Well. Through the county. Yeah. So uh, also mentioning that we uh, it's flu shot season. So if you haven't gotten your flu shot, now's a good time to do it. And it, I understand it takes two weeks to be immune. Right. I'm sorry. That's right. Is it is it two or is it about two weeks before it's fully effective. before it becomes yeah effective? Yeah. So if you're planning on traveling, et cetera, plan two weeks in advance to get your flu shot. Okay. So good time now because Thanksgiving's coming. You'll be prepared right. when all your relatives come. So uh, let's talk about <clears throat> the sentinel chickens again. If, if uh, you know, as, as, as Mr. Price mentioned, there are backyard chickens across the city of Los Angeles. So if, if uh, uh, there's an infected chicken and it's consumed, or if the eggs... Well, so can you talk have, about... I'll, I'll give you some clarification. It sure. has nothing to do with this. Okay. It's a classic, it's a form of... What we call the arboviruses, which means mosquito-borne virus surveillance. These chickens actually, to them, they must, it's like a nothing infection, so you can't even tell they're sick. Mm -hmm. They're specifically, these surveillance flocks are managed by the mosquito abatement districts, and they're, they're uh, the ones, they start with uninfected at the beginning of the season, and they keep on drawing blood samples mm -hmm. and see which ones turn positive. Right. So the question is, if if uh, uh, someone unwittingly consumes an infected I don't think chicken, no. they're not going to nothing. Okay. No. I'm no sure danger. I'm sure they slaughter them. I know they, the people working there have eat, use mm -hmm. their eggs for food and mm -hmm. okay, and so forth. But the next question is notifications in my neighborhood in Glassell Park. It was about 11 years ago. I got a notice on my door that someone in the neighborhood had been infected with West Nile. Do you still do that notification? Well, that is the mosquito abatement. Um, mm -hmm. They do that. Mm -hmm. We. It is a little more tricky now because um, 
of a lot the confidentiality issues mm -hmm. that if there's one if there there has to be at least more than one case and we actually discourage them Okay. It's, which is kind of controversial because I feel like it probably okay. is an effective. So no notices are going out or they are going out? Notices are focusing more on the environmental just mm -hmm. because all the confidentiality around any human cases. Mm -hmm. So the notices are more targeted when there's a lot of ecological warnings like mm -hmm. a lot mis an increased number of mosquitoes and those okay. mosquitoes that are. But there are no longer notices that say someone in this certain radius was recently yeah. diagnosed with West I'm Nile virus because that. that's what the notice said yeah. many many years ago I, I we have discouraged them from doing that even though they felt it was probably much more effective mm -hmm. so there's like some discussions ongoing mm -hmm. because you we have to realize this disease is not like a sexually transmitted disease it mm -hmm. cuts across all races mm -hmm. and all economic groups. We have usually more cases of male. That's probably because they work their outdoors more. Mm -hmm. And of course, more people that are older because their immune systems are weakened and they're more likely to have clinical infection and get diagnosed. But at okay. this point, we're discouraging other than these <coughs> reports, like notification of that individuals within your neighborhood were sick with disease just because of confidentiality okay. issues. Another question, if uh, constituents are experiencing a high number of mosquitoes coming to their house, their lawn, their apartment building, whatever, uh, would you advise them to call 211, the county number, they to report vector? Call that. I would report, recommend they call directly their mosquito abatement district. All those numbers they can either do a search with the five. There's really two, ma there's actually three major ones. West, which covers West, which covers Santa Monica, Palos Verdes. Greater Los Angeles is huge. It go that's your one that takes care of your whole valley mm -hmm. from the West side, West Valley, okay. all the way. And then, and then there's the San Gabriel. It's best to contact them directly so they can target the abatement. So but kind of like 311 for the city, you can call 311 and be connected to whatever agency or department uh, effectively deals with your issue. I would, I would think, that, and I, I've used 211 in the past, someone could call 211 for the county and they could be directed. They probably could. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they could. Just want to make sure that that they could be directed. process is There's still in also, place. just within our public health website, we have all their numbers if they just want to go to one spot. But okay. they are very, um, I don't know, responsive to the community they have their own method of funding and they run a really tight ship um, at their organization and lastly uh, natural mosquito predators are there any that you could I, mention gnat catchers any parrots, birds that hunt mosquitoes I, that you could encourage in your bird feeders? I don't know. Okay. I, I grew up in Oklahoma, and they have what's called, I think they're called purple martins or blue martins, but it's a bird that you would actually encourage and build the, the, huh. the birdhouse, and it would help con eradicate the mosquito problem. This is in the 70s. But I was just wondering if Los Angeles has some sort of program that encourages a natural predator. Natural, the only thing is they have these mosquito fish that are free that mm -hmm. if you want to put them in your decorative Pond. okay. ponds or your swimming pool and you're not swimming in it or you don't mind, they give those away free, they eat mosquitoes. Okay. That's the only kind of, you know, biologic control that I'm, mm -hmm. that they promote. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Colleagues? Any questions? Just uh, mm -hmm. what I said earlier about mm -hmm. coming to council and CLA support and all that. Okay. That's a good idea. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really you. Give the county a hand for that. Too. Yeah. Yes. Protected as public health. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll be holding this in committee pending. Uh, uh, no, let's, uh, well. Send it forward. We'll just schedule it with her. We'll check with her. Okay. Let's do that. So we'll note file it then? Tom, Tom please tell Adam what, what you would like to see out of this. I wanted to well. refer to City Council. Refer to City Council for a full report to City Council and the CLA to review it prior to Council so that our demographics are reflected as opposed to 
including the countywide, as the county has it, but uh, regionally for the city. Okay. And it'll be done within the next two weeks. All right. So then we'll be waiting on the CLA to report first, then go forward. They're not going to report. They're just going to look at it, and they're going to brush up their Shakespeare, so to speak. They're going to brush up the report so make sure it reflects and work with the county for the presentation. And I think Mr. Wesson likes concise PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and then questions for the members, because each of us may have it. And, and I think what you said, Mr. Chairman, is so right, of getting the right liaisons after the effect so that we get involved uh, from that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. All right, colleagues, this is a long agenda, and I'm going to recommend... Now that we have quorum to uh, take items 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11 on consent uh, without objections. The other ones we have reports or presentations on. And the item we just heard was three. We moved forward uh, and we're ready to. So three, five, six. Uh, right. Five, uh, items 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11 on consent. Move it. We're good. All oh, right. Thank you. Then we'll we'll do that. And that brings us to item one, Mr. Lid. Item one, communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Melba Culpepper to the Board of Recreation and Parks Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2016. I would like to invite my friend Mel Culpepper to come up to the table and uh, have a seat. And um, I just want to start by introducing Melba Culpepper, my friend, who we call Mel. Yes. <laughs> who I've known for many years and who is just a wonder. And it's not just my friend, Tom's friend and all of our friends. Um, Mel is just an outstanding community member, leader, um, supporter of children and families in communities that need exactly the kind of support that the Boys and Girls Club that she's the executive director of in Hollywood provide. Uh, she is a great community partner that is a total joy to work with. I, I can't say enough good things about you, uh, and I'm delighted that you have um, are stepping up to serve on the Recreation and Parks Commissioner. So uh, please take it from here and tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> they didn't tell me that part. No. Well, uh, just... Uh, <laughs> good afternoon. Like they have to look... <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, an opportunity to speak, and for um, the honor of serving my community beyond the Boys and Girls Club of Hollywood. When I first received the uh, notification, I thought, is there more? Is there more to be done? But there's always more to be done when we're talking about children, community, families that, that need us the most. Um, obviously, um, we have to really begin to talk about and and address the issue of green space in our communities. Kids have to have a safe place to be. Everybody knows that after school hours, between hours of three and six, are the most vulnerable for kids. That's when things happen that we don't want to talk about. Um, so making sure that kids have structured adult supervised activities, that they're engaged in their local community, and that we're developing the next generation is really what, what I do every day in, in concert with my staff. And having an opportunity to be on the commission will allow me to broaden that scope and make sure that not just my kids and Boys and Girls Club are impacted, but all kids in our community. So it will be an honor for me to serve. On the commission. Wonderful. One thing I'd add to that, Mel, is that uh, Ms. Culpepper really understands families, children, um, and she understands how to collaborate with our park system already. So Mel brings to, uh, to bear real life experience on uh, collaborating with the local park. In this case, it's the, the Hollywood Coenga uh, uh, Recreation Park uh, uh, Parks. And I think that just bringing that on the ground experience with everything that your biography tells us um, makes you a real asset to that commission. So I couldn't be more pleased. And I think um, your leadership, your experience, uh, your perspective mm -hmm. is really going to um, just help uh, flesh out the board even even better than it already is. So so thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, colleagues, questions, move thoughts? The, move the proposal. We're moving it? Moving it. Well, I wanted to say something nice about <laughs> Melba, who was uh, very instrumental in, in, in making an opportunity for young people. They were displaced by the uh, Home Depot 
uh, in Hollywood, the Boys and Girls Club were on uh, DeLongpre Avenue, and they were displaced to its present location on Coinga at Willoughby, mm -hmm. and uh, just, just passionate about helping people and being creative, and I see the general managers in this uh, room as well. Mr. Schultz here too. And I just say, Commissioner, what I said before, we need to partner our Parks Department with our schools, with our Boys and Girls Clubs, with our wives, with any youth organization to help give a place so they get direction. If you look at anybody, who's the greatest, let's ask here, who's the greatest athlete in the world in our lifetimes, members of the committee? Our Jim Thorpe, he wasn't in our lifetime totally. Well, I know he died in Labina, but I mean in our period of growing up. Current, you have one? Rayford Johnson. Um, well, Rayford, I good, but, but I guess they forget. Where do you run? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Okay, Muhammad Ali got his bike stolen. He was like 12 years old, greatest of all time. He corrected me. He went into the police station in Louisville, Kentucky, and he said, I want to go beat up the guy who stole my bike. And the police officer said, no, no, go downstairs to the Youth Athletic League, Police Athletic League. And he got direction, and through that direction, he got the opportunity to ascend to be the greatest of all time. Uh, so those are the opportunities. Someone comes to the door, you give them direction, and it's so important. And then to use that combination with our recreation centers and support, and we must do more members with this budget because it's it's an opportunity. You ask anybody in this room, I shouldn't do that, but I'll try. I bet you remember your coach before you remember your English teacher. Is that true? I see some heads nodding. Okay, now in row three, they're reading, so they remember their English teacher. Okay. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I gave it to you. It was almost home, home right over the plate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So clearly there are no objections on this panel. We move you right to council, which you will be heard tomorrow and confirmed tomorrow in council. Okay. Thank so you. welcome and congratulations, Mel. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to item two, Mr. Lid. Item two, motion O'Farrell Bloomingfield Price relative to the feasibility of creating an enhanced infrastructure financing district along the Los Angeles River to support restoration and maintenance of the river and river adjacent communities. And at this time, I would like to bring up the CLA and CAO's uh, representatives. And as they're making their way forward, I can't tell you how excited I am about the prospect, the possibility of reinvesting tax dollars into the river community as opposed to sending all of it elsewhere. Uh, and the, the governor recently signed um, the uh, 628, SB 628 into law. And so we are beginning to put the building blocks in place uh, for reinvestment at the river, the infrastructure. Um, there are so many opportunities moving forward in terms of alternative 20 from the core and, and the big investment there. Uh, but this motion really does address needs all along the 32-mile stretch of the river that is in Los Angeles, the city of L.A., notwithstanding the 51 miles of the river. Uh, but that is the spirit and intent to establish a permanent revenue stream for these uh, projects. So uh, I, I welcome the both of you to this for an initial report on how that might look. And e either either one. Can I start? <laughs> Councilman Ivania Solbaro with the Legislative Analyst Office. I, we also have a representative from... EWDD here as well, who's been looking at the bill. Thank you. Um, basically, what the bill allows you to do is have the, the city can form what's called enhanced infrastructure financing districts, and um, they they can or they they don't necessarily have to be in old CRA areas, but they can be formed outside of the CRA areas. Mm -hmm. And the intent of the bill is to allow you to use tax increment to fund projects in those districts could be public facilities, and I think there's also uh, private facilities that we can use for this. Thank the you. bill is new, so we are actually still looking into it and some of the nuances of the bill on how it would apply um, at the city at this point. Thank you so much. And it is brand new. In fact, it's not even in effect until January 1. Correct. But that's why we wanted to act on this so, so quickly. And Yvonne, if you could elaborate on, uh, for everyone, what tax increment financing is, the definition of tax increment financing. These are the, the funds that the city would receive for property tax. Um, I, I'm, at this point, I'm not sure, uh, Natalie, maybe you do, or yeah. Jenny, mm -hmm. if it's actually the money from that we were reserving, that we were initially getting from the CRA, or if it's the whole property tax. Yeah, okay. Natalie Brill, CAO's office. Uh, we've been looking at this also because of the bond aspect of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so what this really does is, you know, tax, true tax increment disappeared with the, uh, 
with the dissolution of the Community Redevelopment Act. So what this does is it takes property tax that currently is general fund revenue mm -hmm. and allows you to use the property value increase mm -hmm. to set up these districts. Um, so what we received today uh, from property tax is I think about 26 or 28 percent of that one percent that we get from the county. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that we would get unless the county wishes to give us their portion. But the community college district and the unified school district would not have to give, would not be allowed to give us their money. Mm -hmm. So this isn't true tax increment in the way we used to think of it. It's really just the increase in value in that district that you form mm -hmm. that would allow you to use that money for, to, for infrastructure. Right. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> is unclear yet after talking to bond council and some of the other uh, financial advisors in the, in the state is exactly what this would look like and what the effect would be. Nobody, the only has been actually two done in the state of California in the 25 years of the infrastructure uh, financing districts. They're very rare because they did take two thirds, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, to, to form the district and to issue bonds. The positive part of this bill is that you can form the district through legislation of the governing body, which was the city council. And then you can use that increase in property value, um, set it aside, and use that for whatever projects you would get. There wouldn't be a lot at the beginning. That's why there's the bond comp component. You would do the 30-year analysis of how much growth you would have, and then you would bond against that growth. And that only takes 55% of the voters. Unlike your normal assessment districts and general obligation bonds that take two-thirds vote. Uh, so, and that's the part that is still unclear is what would happen if the city would be the first one out the door to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's unclear what would happen. It's also unclear to us yet um, if this would affect our debt limit. You know, the city has 6% of general fund revenue um, as a debt limit. Right now we're at about 4.8, 4.9%, and we have some very large projects that are coming online to do. Um, you know, the Civic Center Project, Convention Center, um, and our regular general fund uh, MICLA program. Mm -hmm. So the question that's been asked, and I've asked the attorneys to look at, is, is this really part of the general fund or not? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we still need some more work. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a stab at trying to use these funds for economic development, mm -hmm. and it's a first step. But we're still waiting to see, you know, I mean, Moody's has given it a positive credit rating for California, you know, okay. whatever that means for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and We'll we'll wait we'll wait and see if we'll be and then there's also the user fee component mm -hmm. that if you wanted to do a true assessment mm -hmm. you could assess to property owners not just the increase in property value mm -hmm. but there is also is an assessment fee component that once the voters actually vote mm -hmm. you could assess a fee mm -hmm. for um, a public benefit and that's an optional component that's to optional. this bill <clears throat> okay. yes uh -huh. and there's also uh, an optional component that is still unclear about uh, being able for the general fund to loan money to the district and use the increase in the property value to pay back the loan mm -hmm. there's that aspect of it um, so there are a lot of little nuances that still have to be explored exactly what a district would look like and the documents that would be needed to create that district. Okay. And uh, what I want to just say for the record, and this is literally for the record, so no one out there misunderstands this, the, the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District is not a tax increase. It is not a tax increase. It's simply capturing increased... Uh, value in real estate and keeping more of those dollars local and reinvesting them along the river. Well, it's the same amount of money that... Right, right. but it's not, it's, not, it's not the city imposing an additional tax. Right, it's basically... So let's say um, a district was formed and the property values there were $5 million, mm -hmm. right? And let's say you had a $500,000 increase in property value, mm -hmm. right? The city council can make the decision to set aside that $500,000 and use it for like you're describing the LA River project. Mm -hmm. However, that 500,000 could also be used for the general fund. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not that you are um, it, it's almost like a zero sum game. There's only x amount of dollars mm -hmm. and it's up to the city council to decide how they want to use those dollars. So the city decides they want to set aside that $500,000 for the LA River project, that's your policy call. Right. Right. But it's not um, it's not additional 
revenue that we're putting onto the property owners. It's Correct. the natural 2% increase, mm -hmm. right, that the state is allowed, that the county is allowed to put on your property tax every year, right? Every year the, pro the county increases everybody's property tax by 2% because of Prop 13, correct? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're not sure of yet is Proposition 218 and Proposition 26 put a lot of, a lot of conditions on assessments mm -hmm. districts, and this is considered an assessment district, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of case law mm -hmm. surrounding assessment districts. San Diego just lost one of those, mm -hmm. um, and so it's unclear how the law, how the case law affects this. And that's one of the things that actually we're looking at with mm -hmm. um, our attorneys to see exactly how that case law applies to this. And that's something we have not looked into. It's a good thing to look into, but but I would urge you to look into it in such a way that uncouples this from oh, an absolutely. extra assessment, because really what we're going for is. Uh, a, a better way to fund infrastructure uh, to get us to that full vision along the river, uh, ultimately, uh, which is a wonderful new tool that we previously haven't had. So we'll keep this uh, open for a future report backs on uh, on all the things you just went you just went through in terms of information as it comes your way. Um, and uh, so, yeah, colleagues. And the exciting so, part is that oh, I'm sorry. The mm -hmm. exciting part is that it allows for um, economic development and housing, where before it was truly just infrastructure for sewers and um, things like that. But mm -hmm. this enhanced bill actually allows you to do true economic development. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, with respect to this motion, then, uh, I assume there's a finite amount of money that gets raised. When we Does this motion restrict it exclusively to the river, or this allows it to be utilized, for example, as indicated, affordable housing or sidewalks or potholes, uh, the whole range of other great needs that the city has. That's up to you when you form the district. When you form the district, mm -hmm. you would decide that. That's a policy decision. And so, yeah, this, this motion is intended to be river specific. However, Correct. those exact boundaries are not determined. It's just an initial. Uh, it could or perhaps not uh, be consistent with existing boundaries, for example, the boundary of the improvement overlay zone, or right. it could be used in concert with existing plans. But it's, yeah, it's, it's basically more. another tool that the city Correct. has available for economic development that can be used throughout the city. The the river is just an example where we were asked to look at that for as a possible use. Right, we're actually looking at also for um, ITA infrastructure. We've been also been asked to look at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. from more. Um, I guess like fiber optic, mm -hmm. broadband type of yep. development. So you could form, we don't even know if that's possible or not, but it's one of the other things that one of the other committees, ITGS, has asked to look at. But my so, question is, does this encumber, right, there's a set amount that's going to be raised. Does this encumber that money so that then we can't use it for, say, affordable housing or for potholes or for sidewalks? Yes. Once you decide it will be used, once the resolution is passed and you decide it will be used for X project, Unless you go back in and reform the district, mm -hmm. and you would, you would, you could make it as expansive as you want. If you wanted to use in that district that you form for affordable housing, for early, you could do that. But um, or you could just say is this motion is this motion exclusive to the LA River, River. exclusive affordable housing? It, well, it's it's intended for everything that the SB six two eight defines, including affordable housing along the river. So we would, in other words, the 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 intent is to explore what that would look like to pick a zone and within that zone right. uh, do establish an enhanced district, uh, river district, which could also then go toward the 50-50 the match that we're going to need to establish for Alternative 20. So for current prices district, mm -hmm. Senator Price, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be included because the river doesn't he want would. to do that. Well, it would, it would be the whole 32 miles through Los Angeles. So it would, be, it would include the river through the valley and all the way, all the, the seven council districts that the river goes through. It wouldn't be just our districts, for example, where part of all, Alternative 20 will be uh, built eventually. This would be uh, equitably spread all along the river and, and be used for investments along the 32-mile stretch. Right, so so, you, but if it, you're not along the river, then you're not included for the Correct, because this, this zone is specifically for river-related. Right. The, the, the bill allows you to use it for housing, also, so if you wanted to you build it. housing in this district, yeah. the bill allows for it as part of the LA River. If you decide in that 32-mile area that you wanted to build affordable housing, 
this district would allow you to use. Mm -hmm. All right, but my, my question is beyond that, beyond the, oh, yes. the parameters. No. But you have to form a new district. It'd right. be a different so district. So this motion is just for exclusively to the river. Right. Thank you. Jenny Scanlon speaking from EWDD. I also think that it really depends on what properties you take in to form that district. And that will be determined by the scope of the plan, the amount of money that it will be, will be required to actually make that plan a feasible plan, and a financial study of what actual income would come in from the properties that you put into that district. So uh, it's really quite formulaic, I think, when you, when you end up developing your district. Um, however, if you do an infrastructure um, district that incorporates property that you would have wanted to put into it, another district, you can't, you can't overlay districts. So you're going to have to have separated boundaries amongst your infrastructure finance districts and, and then make sure that your plan within that district boundary really incorporates all the things that you want to see done with those dollars. Yes, Mr. Levant. If we don't own the land, we don't control the land, correct? Correct. We on the river? Tax on, it. on the river. But you talk about like having a uh, uh, information highway, what do you call it? The, uh, it's the, oh, the fiber optics? The ITGS request? Yeah, yeah, we haven't looked into that yet. No, but we don't. Much of it is owned by the county of Los Angeles or the Maybe. federal government. I mean, very limited is, or water and power. Mm -hmm. I think we should ask that Dr. Carol Armstrong, one of the finest of all, under the direction of uh, the fine assistant chief engineer, Deborah Weintraub, under Gary Lee Moore, uh, map this in such a way that shows what parties, what parcels there are. There's a lot of public land. There's county land in my district where Universal is. Uh, which did make a contribution to, quote, the river improvements. So I wouldn't be too excited about this right now until we map it and look at what we could do. And also, I do have a feeling that a lot of people, they're all river, but they're not river if they get any hence that they're part of a tax district just for the river. Uh, so this would be something that I would be I, that. I, I want to say something, though, cautionary, uh, Tom. It, it's This is why we have to be so careful about how we talk about it. This is... Definitely, this is not a tax increase. I got it. And, but and the, it's simply yeah. taking monies, first of all, that we're not getting and, and uh, allowing localities, municipalities that are you know, more local, to keep more of the money than we currently are able yeah. to do by establishing the district. Um, and but the district, let's just say, right. let's say it would be from Riverside Drive to San Fernando Road. Perhaps. Like that and but all the so, way in there. So what okay. we'll do is we, we didn't want to waste any time. We want to start going down this road to seeing what it could look like. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst thing we could possibly do is jump to conclusions and give people the wrong idea that we're, uh, you know, uh, encumbering some of their tax dollars. Uh, but we, we have a vision for the river. I think it is, is our responsibility to explore the options, especially with this new tool that we previously have not had. So... Um, you know, the only thing I ask, Mr. Yeah. Chair, is we just map it so we see what's there, what's adjacent right to it as you go forward. Okay, that's all. Right. The financial analysis would look at, once you set the, dis the, the boundaries of the district, mm -hmm. the financial analysis would look at mm -hmm. what properties there are there, what the property tax currently is, what the 2% would be over the next, I don't know, X amount of years, uh, right, um, that you want to have the district in place. And then you would decide how much money you actually have to do whatever work that you need to do. And then you would make the decision if that was enough to issue bonds. Right. That would inform our way forward in yeah. terms of modifying an existing map. So, for example, the river is mapped out in so many different ways already. And we're actually going to hear a report later on the agenda about, about the floodplain draft map. That's another map. We've got the Rio boundaries. We've got all sorts of data to work with currently. I think that as the reports come back, it will inform how that district could look. And, and it will be coming back to this committee uh, before any decisions are made. And as the information comes in, as the research that you're conducting informs the way forward. And that's, that's the reason I wanted to have you just give this initial report. So, Mr. Price. Yeah, question, is, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thanks for your leadership on this. It is Thank you appear to be an exciting tool, another tool to, to use. Uh, I was thinking, though, you mentioned that, that uh, this hasn't been used. It's only been used a couple times in the last 25 years. Correct. That's because the vote threshold was much higher. So is that what the new legislation does? It lowers the threshold now to just 55 percent? 
versus uh, 70, what was it, 75? No, I, yes, I believe that the Infrastructure Finance District had many hurdles um, in its um, sort of former uh, formulas, and, and the vote was one of the big ones. Um, and I think the other difficulty is getting all of the taxing districts to agree, which is still going to be a difficulty with this, is that you, in order to make it effective um, for the city, you really need to be able to incorporate the funds that would typically have gone into the county or some of the other um, taxing districts. Otherwise, we can already use our own tax increment how we see fit within the boundaries of, of the city. So, uh, so really, the the, um, the interest here is in finding a place where we have a shared regional view with the county that that in extra investment makes sense. It will be very difficult for the Community College District and LAUSD to give us their portion of the property tax. Mm -hmm. That's what I think, yeah, they cannot under the state legislation. Right. So we get, you know, 26% of property tax, 28% of the 1%. Mm -hmm. County gets X percent. I don't have that figure at the top of my head. So if the county decided they wanted to participate and give us their share, they could. Mm -hmm. But there's the only share that we are guaranteed is our share of that increase. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's problematic in the sense that it's, it's not, as much money as a true tax increment the CRA had. Mm -hmm. So the concern would be how much money do you actually have and how long would it take you to meet the threshold you need to do the, the mm -hmm. financing. So that's going to be that's going to be the rub when we sit down and do the financial analysis. Mm -hmm. Understood. And what's the, the metrics on it today? What, do you, what would it raise today versus what was being raised in the past? Before in tax increment you got the full one, CRA got the full one percent. So if there was, you know, a, a you know a two percent, if there was an increase in property value, the CRA took that increase, the full one percent of that property value. I mean, they took it all. Um, right now, how much was it? Were the I, do you know? You know that number? I have no idea how much the, the city of LA year? gets in tax increment. Well, we, uh, yeah. well, right now we we only get our twenty eight percent, but uh, in years prior, um, it would get two hundred plus million dollars in its redevelopment project areas. To the CRA. Yeah, to yeah. the CRA annually. Um, so that money is no longer uh, available to us. And this would raise today how much? Well, it, again, it's going to depend on the district. district that you create and... How much would it raise? Oh, it depends we, on the district. Yeah, we wouldn't have any idea until we'd form the district. So we raise it within the district. You're Correct. Gonna, right. Every year your property tax goes up 2%, mm -hmm. right? So we would get, you know, 28% of whatever that 2% is for that district. But the value of that depends on what the outline of the district is. It's very hard to, you'd have to set the boundaries and then we'd have to go back and look at what the so the 200, analysis is. The 200 plus million I was speaking to was related to the 32 project areas mm -hmm. that the city used to have. So within the boundaries of those districts, how, that's how much the city raised. So again, this is starting with um, no boundaries in place, starting to create those boundaries and then you will raise the increment as you create those districts. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're going to raise money along the river for a benefit for the entire city. The the plan that you put into place will determine what projects you fund, and it will also presumably talk about the benefit of those projects to the community it serves as well as the city as a whole, and the presumably to the other taxi uh, entities because you're going to want them to understand the, the benefit. The intent is to establish a zone that will then uh, go toward infrastructure enhancements and projects along the river. That's the intent of, of this motion through the city of LA, not just one particular area, but, but a way of reinvesting uh, the incremental increases in property values back into the communities where the taxes are being drawn from. And it also, um, it's, it's a different animal than the CRAs in, in profound yes. ways. For example, it does not uh, include a tool for eminent domain. No. Which, which is a good thing because the community, uh, there have been issues in the past with the thought of a CRA area coming and then being able to declare a property blighted and then uh, initiating eminent domain proceedings. So this is, um, I think this has great opportunity without the, the negative sort of perceptions from the former CRA areas. This is closer to an assessment district mm -hmm. than it is to like a CRA project area in a lot of ways. In terms of process. In terms of process, correct. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to, you know, declare that something is blighted or needs economic development. You're doing it for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the positive part is that they've added the economic and the housing component, right. which is a positive. But 
the other side of that is it's a true it's like an assessment district as long as you can find a benefit you know you have a little bit more leeway and that's a positive for this type of tool and that's why you asked before there's only been two because infrastructure districts there were other tools in the toolbox that were the same type of thing but it was it was a much easier sell to the public than a true infrastructure um, a geo bonds you know special taxes special assessment districts those tended to be a little bit easier because they were more confined whereas the infrastructure districts I guess I don't mean two one in San Francisco one in Carlsbad those are the only two we could find in 25 years so you could tell it wasn't a great tool but this is a better tool because you can form the district and you never have to issue bonds if you don't want to you never have to go to the voters if you don't want to terrific well we look forward to what your research yields and we would love for you to come back um, let's say before the end of the year that's it's only that's two months now but if not then <laughs> shortly after shortly thereafter and we'll keep this uh, in committee uh, as the information comes your way and we'll work together and uh, on a way forward uh, to see what this could look like for for the river in the future could we look at affordability when you're doing this we look for affordability for mm -hmm. And housing along the river so that there we can would be, make yeah. sure that the river is a, a place that is available to. Uh, when you create your plan, you can include affordable housing as one of the mm -hmm. objectives. You can also include um, any other uh, infrastructure that you'd be interested in and any economic development um, capital improvements that would relate back to a sustainable communities plan. Mm -hmm. So if you have an adopted sustainable communities plan or you create one, mm -hmm. Anything within that plan can be funded through the district. Terrific. If you could come back with uh, as many specifics as, as you can get your arms around by January, that would just be terrific in terms of housing, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of what the, how this new law is, is further defined. Uh, that would be terrific. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will hold this in committee. Uh, for a report back, uh, and we'll we'll give it till January. Let's be realistic here. Thank you. Uh, and having said that, we will move to item number four. Item four: CAO report relative to Los Angeles City Health Commission. This item has also been referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. And uh, on this item, we also have uh, providing a verbal uh, report of the written report that was published a couple of weeks ago from the CAO's office and City Attorney's office. I believe yes we do uh, and on this one uh, mr. Lid we do have comment cards which we will hear after the presentation thank you and welcome good afternoon I'm Patty Huber I'm assistant CAO for the CAO's office um, back in July your uh, council uh, adopted an initiative ordinance uh, that created a 15 member Los Angeles City Health Commission um, it's expected that each council member would appoint one commissioner and that the commissioners and their staff would attend all county meetings that are related to health for city residences, publish an annual health services plan, review health services contracts, and report to council twice yearly in very broad terms. It's a fairly detailed ordinance. Um, uh, at this time, we have prepared a report that just details sort of the bare bones staff that would be required to stand up the commission and support the 15 commissioners. However, there's really an impediment to moving forward because the ordinance, as detailed in the actual initiative language, said that funding needed to be allocated in a revenue neutral manner and not from the general fund. However, at this time, we are not aware of any of the city's special funds that would be eligible to fund this activity. Therefore, only the general fund could pay for this. Um, and to move forward with starting to hire staff and, and um, allocate space and all of that, we have to be able to pay for those things. Um, the city attorney has advised that um, we would essentially have to amend the ordinance in order to allow for uh, the general fund to pay for it. It's a little tricky there, and, and I'll explain it, but um, Kim can, can give you the legal details. Uh, as written, the ordinance requires a 30-day notice to the commission prior to amending it 
but we can't really appoint and set up the commission until we can pay for them. So we sort of have a chicken and egg problem here. Um, the city attorney has indicated that they believe the best path forward would be to amend the ordinance before we began expending money on this particular commission. Um, that said, to just stand up the department, we've identified a need for a minimum of five positions and an executive director, an assistant director, um, some support positions, and an admin position, and some accounting clerical support. Mm -hmm. uh, the current estimated cost is $740,000, uh, including direct and indirect costs, plus some expense monies for about an $800,000 investment. However, this should be viewed as the bare minimum because there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of meetings that staff or commissioners would need to attend and we believe that additional staff resources would be required. Uh, we also believe additional resources, either staff or consultant support, would be required to do the health um, services plan and assessment but have not yet had enough time to really determine what those dollars look like. It's um, just been a little difficult to, to wrap our arms around it. Um, I would note we used existing classifications for the executive director and assistant director. We need to do some more due diligence with the personnel department because clearly these are people who are going to need maybe health field or an, an experience and, and backgrounds and so therefore the actual salaries might need to be higher than what we've currently ballparked. Um, Ms. Uber, let me ask you a question. Yes. So you mentioned the $800,000 investment. Uh, does that include the five positions and the executive director and the assistant executive director and? The executive director, assistant director, the commission executive assistant, mm -hmm. a management analyst, and um, I forget which account, but an accounting position for payroll and paying bills and so on. Uh, are sort of the five bare minimum positions that would be needed. In that budget? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And? Hi, Kimberly Mira from the City Attorney's Office. Um, the ordinance does provide language for amendment. Um, it states that the measure may be amended to further its purpose by ordinance, um, but that's only after 30 days notice has been provided to the commission. And as the CAO has noted, um, in order to appoint the commission, only um, revenue neutral funds can be used and no general funds can be used. So the ordinance as written is, is um, like the CAO says, sort of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, one, uh, one thing that we can do is um, go ahead and amend the ordinance regarding the funding source and then move forward, even though um, the amendment provision requires at least 30 days notice to the commission. Uh, let me ask you, can you could, yeah, go ahead. In terms of process, you could appoint the commission. That doesn't cost you a cent. And there could be the 30-day notice to the commission. That's all that's required. And then we could proceed to do this. And that option was discussed. And I believe the CAO's office has indicated that staff would be required. I'll let the CAO to... So my question was uh, along the same lines. Take us through what it would look like with with no budget, um, because some of the rumblings I've been hearing is you could still get a commission off the ground with and be budget neutral and still have a functioning commission. Well, the commission is a Brown Act committee, okay. and so therefore they do need some level of support in terms of uh, putting the agendas together posting the agendas, putting the, the packages together for the agenda items, whatever reports, et cetera, and so on. That is generally done by a commission executive assistant. That is a city classification um, and would need to be paid. That's not a, a volunteer free type position. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I, I would assume that in this giving the notice there would also have to be provided the opportunity for the commission to actually meet and discuss the issue, which then is a Brown Act meeting, which then just needs to be provided the support in order to have the meeting. Does so it say that? that is You're making an assumption, but does it say that in the 
that's the way Brown Act meetings no, work, I understand sir. That, but does it say that in the ordinance? Say the question. Say what? What you just said. That you it's said, a I assume that we would have to have a Brown Act meeting, et cetera, et cetera. I, if, how else if, could the commission consider an issue in front of it without having a meeting? Does it say? But that's what I'm asking. I don't have it in front of me. I would, I would read it and then I, my, my questions would be answered. But I'll ask you, if it doesn't say that, right? Then, as we could go back to, we can appoint them, right? We all make a recommendation. This is our appointee, and it says give notice to them. So they are a commission, not functioning, but they, in, in other words, to meet the letter of the law. And then it would say there is this commission and we give them notice if it doesn't say that they have to deal with it if it says they have to deal with it then you're you're absolutely right and we've got more things to deal with but if it doesn't say that then we meet we meet the procedural requirement I see what you're saying and then we can go uh, sorry I misunderstood your yeah. question right um, my answer I, I also misunderstood your question until um, Right. I mean, the ordinance just states that notice has to be provided. And it's perfunctory. It's a procedural thing that, that we could do. We could give notice, and then we can then, because we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to encumber a million dollars that we were not budgeted for, and of which the originally we all agreed, well, let's do this because it doesn't cost any money. But if it's going to encumber a million dollars from the general fund, that's a decision that all of us have to make. Uh, I mean, we should go back to the original body that did the ordinance to make that decision. If someone was told, look, you can do this and it's not going to cost us anything, yeah. and now we're going to do it and it's going to cost a million dollars. And so, and, and I think the only thing I would say then is, though, uh, you could do that. You could appoint the commission and you could give them notice, uh, if, but they wouldn't be able to meet. Right. So it, it would be, diff you know, they, if they had any questions or wanted to discuss it as a body, we would kind of be putting them into a bind of not being able to do that. Right. But the choice is really ours. This is a question is of us having to figure out to pay for something that wasn't going to cost us anything. And my question also is um, in relation to the number of meetings that seem to be defined in the ordinance as it's drafted. Uh, so what do you say about that? You're saying that how many meetings are you feeling are required um, based on? The ordinance didn't specify, at least that I can recall, how many times the commission itself had to meet. Right. But most of our commissions meet approximately once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the <laughs> ordinance did say... that the commissioners or their staff are empowered to attend all meetings, hearings, working sessions, or other events held or conducted by any and all governmental bodies, agencies, or entities of the County of Los Angeles that formulate, debate, enact, and or implement health policies or actions unless otherwise prohibited but by it law. says empowered not required empowered to but not required to um, the uh, the right the ordinance do you want Patty do you want me to go ahead and speak yes to that? please because um, you know the ordinance better than I do <laughs> um, the ordinance says that one or more Commission members or Commission staff members um, shall uh, if you read it collectively the Commission is empowered to and shall it does say and shall it, it literally says in black and white and it shall does say and shall um, and also just I, I wanted to point out that the ordinance as written um, is health matters not public health mm -hmm. so as written the ordinance would require commissioners and or staff to attend all public health meetings um, meetings regarding hospitals and health care services delivery and mental health um, and we do have um, we did get a rough breakdown from um, the county um, there are approximately 620 public meetings a year 400 and 400 stakeholder meetings that are hosted or co-hosted by the Department of Public Health um, and then there are several invitation only um, meetings uh, and we if we are attending these meetings we have every reason to believe that we would be treated as any member of the public so any um, 
we would not necessarily be able to force our way into an invitation only meeting if we were not invited are you is the city attorney's office interpreting this as a requirement though to attend these hundreds of meetings that's what, I'm not really clear on that we are um, it t t the meetings that affect <laughs> city uh -huh. so somebody would have to determine if a meeting is held if it if it affects the jurisdiction of the city of Los Angeles mm -hmm. of course several of these meetings mm -hmm. may you know occur affect jurisdictions possibly outside the city mm -hmm. um, or they may have a mix of items. And or this is really important. We have to decide if we're going to appoint friends or enemies. Right. <laughs> friends. And I guess what Always I'm saying right now is sort of unclear at this point how many of those we have a thousand plus that. meetings, mm -hmm. how how many would would be relevant to the city of Los Angeles right now? That's and undetermined. You're. It seems as though you're concerned about the legal ramifications um, beyond just. The, the financial requirements that you feel this this comes with um, the legal ramifications of of rolling it out and then not being able to attend all those meetings is that we, is that accurate for me to say um, we would we would we would need to find a way to um, uh, to staff the meetings that affect at least the city of Los Angeles so we're talking hundreds again in theory there in, in theory, theory. I mean, it, part of the difficulty is, first of all, finding out where all these meetings are and looking at all of those agendas. And we've been struggling just to try and get a sense of what they might be. Mm -hmm. But the county is also dealing with issues on what they view as a system. Mm -hmm. So their hospital system or the public health system. Jails. So uh, mm -hmm. jails, other things. So it, it, it's hard to know. A, if a particular item how it's going to pertain or not pertain to the city so that's something that we're going to have to learn a little bit as this Commission gets up and running and then again that's what's made it very difficult to really flesh out what the scope and then associated staffing resources might be for the for this department can you talk about any any deadlines I mean we we as, as mr. Cedillo mentioned uh, you know we we've Pass this in July. We we felt like we were going to be appointing commissioners right around now, or maybe a little bit before. Um, can you talk about any deadlines or time limits uh, in, related to to this? Um, the ordinance itself does not uh, provide any deadlines when commissioners have to be appointed or or, or when this has to be rolled out. I mean, our instructions were that we would form a health commission, and that's why we've been I've been pushing. To, to get this report uh, heard so what what are some of your initial recommendations based on this conversation we've just had how do we move forward how do we remove the impediments well the the first thing would reiterate what you uh, would be that the city attorney would need to be instructed to per, to prepare and present an ordinance to amend Mm -hmm. what's in uh, the existing ordinance to allow for the expenditure of general funds mm -hmm. um, as we noted in uh, our report our office would continue to to work on the development of the department including space options um, working with personnel on the qualifications for the um, assistant director and director positions um, we're also going to explore to see if maybe we could place this commission in an existing department to help with um, a little bit it would maybe help eliminate some of the admin accounting positions just to save a little bit of money but at the end of the day there's still going to be more that's going to be needed given the numerous number of, of positions and we would continue to try and flesh out what that more might look like um, and then report with additional recommendations it seems to me that while obviously our interest is in, in selecting our commissioners that they would have um, training or, or relevant experiences in the health fields but it doesn't seem that the administration of that Commission would make that necessary it seems that those are more kind of ministerial and administrative convening meetings training people um, postings etc I would say that for the like the Commission executive assistant the accounting position and the management analyst those are generalist type positions 
However, we assumed for the executive director and their assistant director that that's where the expertise in some health background, because they're as staff to the commission would be more largely and heavily involved in the development of the annual health services plan that's required by the ordinances, um, as well as the review of health services contracts. That's something you might need a little bit of expertise to actually understand what what those contracts are, are providing and, and the services being provided. And then um, in reporting to council on the, on the status of that because there's also a strategic plan for the you know of ensuring that our city residents are getting the health services um, that we as a city believe they should have so that's where we felt that expertise is in those two positions and then as we fill in the staff who would be attending these meetings and working on these issues that again that's where it would be the the more generalist positions would just be generalist positions mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, I think that we have a difficult set of options to work with in the immediate. Um, and I'm going to make some proposals, but we do have speaker cards on this. And um, so let's hear the speaker cards. And, and if you could both stick around for, for questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, and first, we have Mickey Jackson uh, and then Adam Cohen and then uh, Bradley Hertz. Apologies for my voice. I think I have East Nile for, uh, virus. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> it's been going on forever and ever. Um, I read this report, and I have read an awful lot more reports than I care to admit. And this is one of the most masterful reports of negativity I think I have ever seen. Not a good word. Going not back. not going back a long time. Not uh, two sentences of maybe we could solve it with this. Nothing. Just negative, negative, negative. Barrier, barrier, barrier. Larded up with everything that could be thought up to cause expense. To me, this is a document to justify delay, to just try to delay it to death. Um, I ask a few questions. I don't know if anybody can answer me. Um, I'm glad this committee is trying to take a, a can-do uh, position because it's clear the, uh, the CEO has taken a won't-do, can't-do, don't-want-to-do position. Um, the average staff for most committees, I think, is much smaller than this. Uh, I think this amount of staff is absurd. Um, I don't know that every commission or committee has its own accounting person. I mean, I think those people get shared a lot. And uh, I go to a lot of health things at the county. And uh, they don't always have many health people on those committees. They, they have their commissioners are often the experts. So I urge you to refute this, this negative, don't do it, can't do it, won't do it report, and push forward anyway and get this going immediately. There's been a lot of time, and to take that kind of time to come up with this kind of report, to me, is just kind of shameful. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. Mr. Cohen. Good afternoon, Mr. O'Farrell, Mr. Cedillo. My name is Adam Cohen. I'm a consultant for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm also a PhD student at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, Master's in Public Health, Bachelor's. I know too much public health. I, uh, I think that this... City Commission is a very, very, very good idea. I think it's very important considering LA City, which I'm a member of, is a resident of, is a 41% uh, of the LA County population. So you are definitely one of the major funders for the LA County Department of Public Health. So I think that the can-do attitude that Ms. Jackson had just mentioned is, a, is great that it's coming from you. And I think that the barriers, public health always has barriers. Mm -hmm. And accountability always has barriers. And I think that this is just so it needs to be overcome and dealt with. Mm -hmm. I think that the Public Health Commission can happen. I don't think it's going to cost that much to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bradley Hertz. Good afternoon. Bradley Hertz from the Sutton Law Firm on behalf of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation and Michael Weinstein. Um, we don't believe there's a chicken and egg problem. We believe, and when we first spoke with Andrew Westall at uh, the council president's office, the thought was the first step would be uh, having each council member appoint one commissioner 
and then the commission would be officially formed and then the commission would decide what do we need in terms of staff, in terms of frequency of meetings and other issues. Um, I don't think there is legal authority for the council to amend the ordinance until such time as a commission is at least appointed. And that's the um, section 7 of the act amendment says the measure may be amended to further its purposes by ordinance passed by a two-thirds vote of the council and signed by the mayor after at least 30 days notice has been provided to the commission. So I think the, uh, the chair's idea of let's get the commission appointed, then the council with city attorney and presumably consultation with us and others could come up with amendments with regard to funding, give 30 days notice, there's nothing affirmative required of the commission yet by that point, and then that could resolve any inconsistencies. Um, with regard to the funding, we were quite surprised with the $800,000 cost estimate and the thought that there might be a thousand meetings to attend or a thousand hours of meetings to attend. Um, while Section 8.271 does say the Commission is empowered to and shall cause one or more of its members or staff members to attend all meetings, there is a fair amount of subjectivity and it's, the, it's not all meetings that have anything to do with health. It's meetings that formulate, debate, enact, and or implement health policies or actions. So as an example, the very able report we got today from the doctor regarding the mosquito abatement issues um, and the West Nile virus, the commission might not have sent anyone to that because there was no formulation or debating or enacting or implementing of a health policy. So we think there's, there's a lot of overestimating. Maybe government by its nature is overly conservative, but we don't see an $800,000 budget being needed. We don't see um, that level of burden uh, on the city. And finally, uh, there should be cost savings realized by the commission once it's up and running and it starts looking at contracts that the county has, looking at what the city is paying for certain health services, that there would be savings realized and that would help offset or even um, outweigh any kind of cost that the committee have. Uh, has and then one last thing is that yeah, lastly <laughs> la okay lastly the the city is of course a huge vendor of the county mm -hmm. and so for the county to say well they can sit for an entire meeting or do a public records act request we think is disingenuous and we see cooperation between the two and so we think step one should be the formation of the commission thank you Mr. thank Hertz. you uh, if if I could have uh, a CEO and CL, uh, CA back up that would be terrific so I'm just uh, Hearing your presentation, um, knowing that our charge with this commission, with this committee rather, and forming uh, the commission and hearing this report before our committee, before it goes to council, et cetera, um, and then hearing the comments that you just heard from representatives of AHF, uh, I just, uh, I, uh, we know that um, public health is in everyone's interest, and we also know that um, we're at a particular time of heightened awareness of various issues, whether it's meningitis, whether it's Ebola, whether it's West Nile, uh, you name it, we're inundated. And, and we, we all are on the same page in terms of a concern with public health. So what I'd like to do is, is it insert that sense of urgency that I think we are feeling on this and ask for you to report back in two weeks. Literally, we'll, we'll agend you two weeks from now, uh, agendize you rather, uh, and report back on the scope of work of the commission vis-a-vis -vis, um, number of meetings. Uh, you just heard the kind of the feedback from HF. If you could kind of respond to that. Um, so number of meetings, very important. Scope of work of the commission. Um, also report back on how you would suggest or ideas or or roadblocks or challenges to revising the ordinance. Um, and maybe further define a budget and maybe different examples of what a budget could look like with a bare minimum. You mentioned a staff assistant to at least staff you know, a commission, for example. Um, and then instructions on how we can appoint a commission with existing resources. 
uh, which was talked about earlier, and Mr. Cedillo brought that up uh, specifically. Um, and as I mentioned, oh, and then lastly, further define what all meetings really means. I, I think, and, and I will not criticize you for taking an approach in the abundance of caution. I'm not going to be critical of that. Um, but I am going to suggest that we have to have a sense of urgency of how we're going to figure this out uh, because of, of the instructions that we have and the considerable concerns uh, on public health and how they affect Angelinos. So if you could report back within a couple of weeks on, on that literally. Okay. Okay, that'll be the... I'm sorry, Star. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Um, any questions about that? Terrific. Mr. Cedillo, anything to add to those instructions? No. Okay, we're good. So you'll be reporting back at our next regular committee meeting, Star tells me, and that will be in a, yeah, next month, a few weeks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And so we'll continue the item until then. All right. Uh, and then... Okay, terrific. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Cedillo has to leave because he has another commitment. This is a long committee hearing, I know. We have a few other items which will, um, will be continued anyway, so quorum isn't an issue. But we do want to hear the reports for the record, so we will uh, go ahead and move on to item 7. Item 7, discussion item, Bureau of Engineering to provide a presentation in regard to potential Los Angeles River floodplain revisions. Thank you. And we have coming up, we have um, Richard uh, Lifefield, I understand? Uh, I'm Ted Allen, Deputy City Engineer at the okay. Bureau of Engineering. We do have Richard Lifefield here from the U.S. Army Corps, okay. if you want him to come forward. Uh, yes, please. That would be terrific. Okay, so I'm going to... Mm -hmm. Start out by giving some background information on how flood hazard areas are handled in the city and nationwide, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I'll give a summary of a recent study by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers providing updated information on floods, flood hazards within a portion of the L.A. River from Barham Boulevard to First Street near downtown. And our recommendation to submit the information to FEMA for remapping of special flood hazard areas on their flood insurance rate maps. Flood insurance rate maps, sorry. Uh, before beginning, I want to emphasize that the proposed changes to these special flood hazard areas are not a result of any proposed LA River related projects. These are all reflect, this reflects current conditions, and uh, so we want to make that very clear. Also, a link to the study that being discussed is contained on our LA River website at www.lariver.org. And another very useful website is our floodplain management plan website at eng.lacity.org slash projects slash FMP for Flood Plain Management Plan. So a little background on the National Flood Insurance Program. In 1968, U.S. Congress passed the National Flood Insurance Act, which established the National Flood Insurance Program. I may abbreviate it here and there as NFIP. Um, it's a federal program administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, with the purpose of reducing future flood losses. The NFIP makes federally backed flood insurance available in communities that adopt and enforce floodplain management ordinances to reduce future flood damage. A tool in administering the, uh, the NFIP is the flood insurance rate map, often referred to as the firm map, which maps special flood hazard areas which have a greater than 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The City of Los Angeles joined the regular phase of the NFIP in 1980, and in 1990, um, a further voluntary program called Community Rating System wa was created, and the City is also a current member of that, and we have a clas classification rating of 7, which provides a 15% insurance premium reduction for those properties in the special flood hazard areas. That's for going above and beyond the minimum standards of the NFIP. Mm -hmm. So going on to the flood insurance rate maps, uh, 
FEMA published the first flood insurance rate map in the 1980s, initially based on their floodplain mapping data. Subsequently, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 1992 released a comprehensive study uh, called the Los Angeles County Drainage Area Review, often referred to as LACTA for the abbreviations, which analyzed the floodplains for the entire Los Angeles River watershed as well as other areas of L.A. County. The study found that L.A. River would experience significant flooding in a 100-year flood event. And at the time the LACTA study was prepared, the primary focus was on the lower reaches of the LA River because that's where much more estimated economic damage would occur. That study also did provide floodplain maps for the upper reaches of uh, the LA River, which we're discussing today. But for an unknown reason, those were never used to revise the FEMA flood insurance rate maps. So now moving to the current study, in September 2013, the U.S. Army Corps released a final draft report for the Los Angeles River Ecosystem Restoration Feasibility Study. Because the requirement of the restoration projects would be that they, can't, they have to maintain or improve flood conditions, they can't worsen them, it was necessary for the study to set, to analyze the baseline of what are the current conditions. And so again, I want to reiterate, we're talking about current conditions here today. Um, the study performed flood models for a portion of the LA River with the most promise for ecosystem restoration, which included the soft bottom stretches. The reach is about 11 miles long, extending from the western side of Forest Lawn Cemetery at Barham Boulevard, downstream to the First Street Bridge in downtown Los Angeles. That reach is referred to often as the Arbor Reach. The study um, used updated hydraulic models and topographic survey data um, along with the hydrology from the 1992 report to remap the floodplain uh, flood maps for that area. It did find that many portions of the reach could not confine a 100-year storm event and ge generated uh, estimated floodplain maps um, of the 100-year storm we refer to the areas that would have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The study recommends or notes that they're very different from the existing FEMA flood insurance rate maps because the earlier 1992 study had never been incorporated into those uh, FEMA maps. And therefore it recommends that the findings be submitted to um, FEMA for incorporation. So what is the process to do that as a community, uh, the local partner, the city would be the one responsible to, to submit this to FEMA and with using what's called a letter of map revision. But becomes, because some affected properties are in the cities of Burbank and Glendale, they would also have to be a joint applicant in the process. And notification of the affected property owners is also required as a part of the letter of map revision submittal. Once that's received by FEMA, they would perform a technical review, which we estimate would take six months to a year. And then they would later do a letter for physical map revision, which could be another uh, 18 months or so to finish. And lastly, there would be a 90-day public review period. So all in all, we expect it would be about a two to three year process for FEMA to finish their um, flood, flood insurance rate map revision. I'm sorry, can, you, can you go over steps three and four again? Yeah, the, we have, uh, first we submit the letter of mm -hmm. map revision. Property owners, and then FEMA evaluates. Well, the letter of map revision goes to FEMA itself. Okay, okay. And then FEMA would perform a technical okay. review. And we estimate that would take six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And then because this is such a large volume of changes, they would also do a physical map revision process, which mm -hmm. can take as long as another 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then there's a 90-day public review period after that before the final maps would be published. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the recommended process forward, we've met with uh, all the affected council off districts, including you. Thank you very much. You have the bulk of the uh, affected properties. And we've met also with yeah. the general managers of planning and Department of Building and Safety. We have like 95% of the properties. Yeah, I didn't run the percentage, but it's up there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so as of 
all of that discussion, the following steps are what are recommended. Mm -hmm. We would work with Burbank and Glendale to submit the letter of map revision of FEMA uh, as early as hopefully December, depending on how long it takes to you know get their um, buy-in on the process. Mm -hmm. We would hold two public meetings during the process, one early on when the letter of map provision is submitted and one later when the final maps are about to be um, released. We would, uh, in the meantime, because that is a two to three year process, we would prov provide the proposed floodplain boundary data in GIS format to both planning and building and safety so that any developers coming to develop their properties on those affected parcels would be notified of the ongoing process and what it may mean to them so they could use that and make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. However, in the short term, there would not be any um, special requirements enforced on those. It would be up to the developer to decide uh, what they wanted to do. Once FEMA got to the step where they were ready to issue the physical map revision at that point there would be very low likelihood of any changes then we recommend that the city engineer would issue a special order to create a special flood risk area with the parcels in that physical map revision um, and start enforcing the city's rule the rules special flood hazard area rules on those parcels even before the final firm map is published but it would be near the end of that process uh, at that point, you know, the main effect impact on parcels is that um, buildings with a finance by federally backed mortgage uh, would have to requ would be required to purchase flood insurance, uh, and builders would have to meet certain requirements, such as building the lowest floor one foot higher than the base flood elevation and some similar requirements like that. So, a brief summary of of the number of parcels um, total this would add 1957 parcels to the special flood hazard area if approved as the included in the US Army Corps uh, study and 1727 of those are in council district 13 213 of them are in council district 4 13 are in council district 1 three are in Council District 14, and then one is shared between one and 13. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all generally very close to the LA River Channel. All the flooding, it didn't generally spill out very far from the river in any direction. It kind of stayed close to it. So that concludes my prepared report, if you have any questions. Thank you. And Mr. Leifeld, would you like to add anything to this? Well, I think Ted summarized it very well. Mm -hmm. um, we did. I guess I could just add, we did contact FEMA to find out why hadn't earlier studies been used to publish updated mapping, and, and uh, they don't know themselves. They've researched everything they can find. They've looked at the uh, scopes of work they'd had with some of the contractors they'd used back in the 90s, and uh, they just don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a mystery uh, mm -hmm. that may, may, may never be solved. But I guess it makes no difference at this point. We know what the mapping says today, and we just move forward from today. So I have a question. Uh, I have many questions, but the first one is, was the 1936 or 1939 floods, with, were, were either of them, or, or the 2004-2005 rains, were any of those the 100-year floods? We're, we're going back, you know, going on 80 years now, in an 80-year time span. What does the 100-year flood look like? Is it one of those? Well, the 36-38 the flood, I don't have the, mm -hmm. the frequency of, of that event. That, that's the kind of flood we're talking about. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's exactly a 100-year flood or close mm -hmm. to it. The 2004-2005 was, was not. That was not. Uh, not on par know. with what happened in 38 and 36? I'm sorry? It wasn't on par in terms of no, no, sir. water volume? No. Um, Again, I don't have the, the frequency mm -hmm. analysis of the 30 floods. We can find that out for you and send it along uh, mm -hmm. through Ted. And the, uh, another question I have off the top of my head is, with future projects through the area where most of these parcels are affected, through infrastructure and river 
improvements, enhancements, et cetera, could there be reengineering to f reduce the flood risk? Uh, or are we talking about just an overwhelming sort of epic, you know, on par with the Panama Canal type of engineering that would do that? Or could it be something, we always used to talk about river improvements as being hydrology neutral. Maybe we need to be talking about river improvements being hydrologically, hydrologically helpful. What, what do you all think about, you know? Well, certainly that's... It's going to affect the way we design things at the river, isn't it? it, it well, let me, let me back up a second. We, mm -hmm. Back in 92, when we did the lacto review study that Ted discussed, we did evaluate, uh, and that's where this, this uh, study originated in 92, mm -hmm. uh, evaluate what, if any, improvements should be made along the entire length of the Elliott River to reduce flooding. Um, unfortunately, the, the expense of the upper reach of the Elliott River uh, was not outweighed, was not justified by the damages uh, that, that were determined to exist at that time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if we did a new, I'm just saying perhaps if we did a new study now, uh, the results may be different that would show that a project would be economically justified. It's not something that, that we're underway on right now, mm -hmm. um, but it is the kind of study that Corps of Engineers does. Um, it, it would be a significant undertaking, mm -hmm. whatever it was. Would rec uh, the study would recommend? I'm s pretty sure, certain that it would be a significant uh, undertaking, uh, very expensive, if nothing else, due to the real estate costs, if mm -hmm. not the construction costs. So it would be a significant thing. The um, the river in many places just was not designed for the type of flooding that can take place now. Back when the project was first built, the Oliver was first designed, uh, there weren't not um, as much development back then. Uh, some of the San Fernando Valley was still orchards and uh, orange trees and things. And, and the, the uh, sophisticated drainage system that we've built to take flows to the Oliver River uh, wasn't necessarily envisioned back then. So the project that was built in the early uh, days w was sufficient for the time, but certainly not anymore. Yeah, I think even back then, the <coughs> what was called the standard project flood is about equivalent to what we would now consider about a 50-year storm event, I think. Well, the, the, the flood that was used back then was what was considered to be the standard project flood. In other words, a very large event, mm -hmm. not expected to be exceeded. But it was rain falling on orchards, right. and and maybe captured in places uh, whereas now it's all running right off, right off into the channels and into the <coughs> river very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I have a list of questions. You mentioned the uh, letter of uh, letter of map revision. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a timeline on when that'll be sent? We can have it prepared and ready to send even by late November. And then, so depending, if Burbank and Glendale are fine and cooperative and it don't have to go through much process to be on board, it, it could be late November, early December. Mm -hmm. If not, I mean, I assume if, if either of them were outright opposed to it, we could revise it such that it only affected the city of L.A. I, I would imagine we wouldn't be prohibited from going without them. But, of course, we would try to get... To them on board to submit them all up together. Because I don't want to delay this information to the 1,957 parcels that are affected by this, you know, this new map. Right. I certainly wouldn't want to wait until those cities agree or not agree on sending out the map revision letter to be informed. Right. Well, we could certainly give it to planning and building and safety mm -hmm. even earlier so that they can start informing them even ahead of the official mm -hmm. letter of map revision going. Okay. I, I, think it's, <clears throat> I think that's important. Okay. And, um, just, it's, you know, if my parcel was on here, I would want to know. Sure. And, and the public has a right to know. Um, in terms of the departments, uh, building and safety, and building and safety is not here today, correct? Oh, you are okay. Oh, oh, thanks. Uh, do you, would you like to join? Uh, do you have in case questions come up? Um, I'm so sorry. I would have invited you right up. Are you Catherine? Yes. Oh, hi, Catherine. I'm so sorry.
Thank you. Catherine Nuesca? Catherine Nuesca. Welcome from uh, uh, Building and Safety. So my question is, how will this be flagged in the interim in terms of when someone c brings an application for plan approval? Um, they want to improve an existing, uh, you know, development or structure or, you know. Well, once they have given us the data and information, it gets flagged in our, you know, permit processing mm -hmm. um, system and, and it just basically a red flag that tells us that it is um, future flood zone. So how soon can that happen? Does the letter of map revision need to go out before that can happen? No, we could do that now and just let mm -hmm. them know that the process is ongoing. It's informational only, mm -hmm. so I don't see anything that would stop us from doing it now. I would recommend it. Okay. I would recommend that. Um, and then as far as the base flood elevation, okay, will that appear on ZMS, the city's system, once? Because I know, I know it varies yeah. by location. Right now, in the official maps, every parcel has it. Right now, what we have, we haven't resolved it down to the parcel level, level but we could right now flag all the parcels. Mm -hmm. And on a parcel-by-parcel parcel basis, let's say one came in, it's pretty easy for us to figure out fairly quickly. It's mm -hmm. just, it's not all automated for us to be able to give them right mm -hmm. now the base flood elevations for all of the parcels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I know from what I, the material that I've seen leading up to this committee day is, the 100-year flood would have some properties under water by one foot for a, a period of time. Uh, and the worst, worst case, it's up to five, six feet from what I've seen. Yeah, there were a few very local areas that actually went more than 10 feet even, but they were very small areas. And I think the study said the average was somewhere around four to five feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then let me ask, ask you this. As an engineer, and planning isn't here, but... Do you think this type of information will influence policy through building and safety in terms of the fact that we are one of the most, if not the most, paved city in the world? That's, as you mentioned, that's affecting the veracity of, of this whole issue in terms of the chance of flooding. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think the city is kind of well along that path already with the lid ordinance and, um, you know, now we're doing a lot more green streets and things in public right away, trying to always be, like you said, at least neutral, if not better, mm -hmm. when we do new developments. So as far as whether it would influence them, I don't know, but I think the city as a whole has taken a pretty um, strong stance in that area. And, and in terms of other issues, the um, out-of-compliance properties, <clears throat> the paved parkways, the paved, well, you can pave a front yard in L.A. That's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. But might, you can't park there necessarily. It's against the code, but people do. But, but the, the paved yards, the paved parkways across the city, would building and safety be interested in, I don't know, trying to encourage people to remove the pavement from their parkways and remove the pavement from their front yards and... Well, the code now um, has 50% maximum for pay, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, if there's an ordinance that's passed, we could mm -hmm. influence people not having Just more thinking ahead people. more, uh, you know, in terms of floodplain and watershed and what we can do, because I think this really highlights that, that issue. Um, and let's see. What types of developments may be significantly restricted? We have project proposals all along the river. Some of them in the areas where they're, you know, one of these 1,727 parcels. Well, we've noticed that <clears throat> currently we're having people actually create basements because of mm -hmm. the floor area, you know, um, mm -hmm. limitations and so forth. So that definitely is going to be affected. Mm -hmm. um, they won't be having any basement. Right, subterranean parking. Is um, a real issue, and we've seen some instances where uh, it poses a real danger when there's a water main break, when there's subterranean parking. Right. With um, so far, no one's been trapped in an underground garage yet, but uh, we know what happened in Westwood, where I don't know, a thousand cars were destroyed, or whatever that number was. I've seen the same thing in my district on a much smaller scale, oh, wow. uh, just through a water main break. So we know from that um, that that would be an issue. Right. Uh, with this. So it's going to, 
it's going to change, at least in these zones, the building code, isn't it? Well, it'll follow the same guidelines yeah. it would within the flood zone. So uh -huh. it would they need to raise the building okay. and, and mm -hmm. um, one foot higher than it would for the flood line. Okay. And are there plans for uh, workshops or town halls or I should not be asking this, but but <laughs> engineering BOE in terms of getting the word out? Yeah, we plan to do a minimum of two meetings. One right as the letter of map revisions being submitted and one kind of later in the process. We also do regular um, public outreach things. Our website has a lot of FAQs and flyers and so as a part of that community rating system that I mentioned earlier that's voluntary that goes beyond just the basics of the NFIP, um, we do public outreach as part of that. So minimum two meetings plus the normal public outreach, but there may be more depending on, you know, the need. But, but I think especially important and helpful will be flagging those parcels so that if someone didn't know about the public outreach meeting, you know, it'll still be brought to their attention when they come to planning or building and safety. If you cover this already, forgive me, but how often is the flood insurance map uh, updated? How often? I don't know if there's, I don't think there's a regular process to update the whole thing. I don't know if maybe Rick knows. It's kind of an area by area update just based on like this study covered an 11 mile stretch. So we might revise it here, but I don't know that they do everything all at once. And you might have answered this too, at least partially or all the way. Is this 11 mile stretch? It's, it's in the Arbor study, obviously. Do you think, just anecdotally, it's the area of the river that is at greatest risk of flooding, or is it just simply because it was in the 11 miles? Uh, I, I don't know if because I that's, don't. that could be a very interesting <laughs> question to have answered, especially well, if there are areas at greater risk than this. Our, our uh, 92 <laughs> study did provide some mapping using a, a grosser level of survey information, but it did show significant flooding upstream of the Arbor region. It did. Yes. The, the, the study we did for the LA River Ecosystem study gave us a vehicle to generate additional mapping, better, more precise mapping, mm -hmm. and that's why we have better, better representation of the 100-year flood for this reach. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have the funding, the project, the resource, or the way to analyze it upstream. Mm -hmm. but but our 92 report showed that there's definite flooding up there as well onto Hunga Wash and, mm -hmm. and some of the upper reaches of the river. Right, right. Uh, so let me ask this question again, but kind of differently. Uh, remove sort of the epic infrastructure goals to, you know, reduce the risk of flooding to the parcels mentioned so far. <clears throat> and, and are we looking from an engineering standpoint of higher levees along the river, perhaps? And I ask that just based on this report and, and this conversation. I think if, if you wanted to look at how you could prevent flooding altogether in these areas, mm -hmm. it would have to be a study that would look at how to do that. But it wasn't done in the current studies. Yeah. So, but I would imagine it would be something like that. Mm -hmm. And the downstream side, they did parapet walls. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there have been any preliminary discussion. The way we solved it on the lower reach was we either raise the levees or we put parapet walls on the top and, of the And system. describe a parapet wall. Just a, a mm -hmm. vertical. Just a short, vertical. Short vertical wall. Short wall. Uh, four feet, six feet. Some, uh -huh. some places maybe higher than eight feet. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a concrete wall mm -hmm. uh, on top of an existing levee. But other places we just raised the levee. Mm -hmm. And that's how we solve the problem downstream, uh, say from where the city of Compton is, approximately that location, all the way to the mm -hmm. Pacific Ocean. And in some places, we changed a trapezoidal shape mm -hmm. to a rectangular shape uh -huh. to get accommodate more, more volume. Space. Right. Mm -hmm. So we did a combination of those things. Um, perhaps a, a method like that would work. Um, we hadn't studied it. Mm -hmm. we, we did. We, you know, that we did briefly look at a few options, um, but we haven't really spent the time we'd like to spend on, on addressing this. But it is, based on our previous 92 report, mm -hmm. it would be an expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So what I would, uh, since, I mean, we're not under immediate threat of the 100-year flood, and I realize that um, we're in a drought. 
Now I'm hoping maybe it'll last a while longer. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm really not. But I, uh, I, I think that we should. Can you come back before the end of the year? As if, I think that we have, have to have a sense of urgency about this because I think the public just isn't going to. They just don't know about this yet, even though this document has been published. Uh, but it's it's a document that's about that thick. So, um, in terms of just report back on the uh, the four steps. The status of the letter of map provision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within a, uh, yeah, before before we break for the holidays. Sure. If you could report back, that would be terrific. So one letter sent to FEMA on the map revision, um, and I'll add I'll add a fifth one. Two letters sent out to the affected parcel owners. Um, three, you know the the FEMA. Well, you can't really control that. Um, but then just sort of the timeline, maybe in the, in the form of a graph or something. Sure. But the first most important thing to do, I think, is public notification. And then just kind of publish what the process will look like um, in terms of the, the two, at minimum, two community meetings. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to we're gonna want to get that information out. And, and right now, even though it's, it's a lot of parcels, it's a fairly small universe in terms of the community groups. It's the river right. communities mm -hmm. that need to hear about this. Um, and we'll do our, our best to help with that communication piece, um, especially given that it's not 95%, it's not but it's about 85% of the properties right. are in the 13th. <clears throat> And so that's that's uh, what I recommend, and I appreciate your your report today. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you all have anything else to add? Okay. Terrific. Well, then, uh, Adam, Mr. Lid, does that? No, we have one. We have. We have. Oh, that's right. We have another item, don't we? That's item number eight. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> okay. Back to this. Item eight, please. Item eight. Department of Recreation and Parks report relative to grant funding from the California <coughs> Department of Education 2013-14 Summer Food Service Program for the Re Department of Recreation and Parks Summer Lunch Program. Hi. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Sophie Atkinson, Department of Recreation and Parks Grants Administration. Item number eight is requesting retroactive approval to submit a 2014 grant application for the summer lunch program and approval to accept the awarded grant. Uh, the department has administered this program for nearly 40 years. It's offered at over 100 rec and parks facilities throughout the city. It runs for about nine weeks and serves well over 190,000 meals during that period. And here with me is Bertha Calderon. She's the Summer Lunch Program Coordinator and has been since 2005. Welcome to you both. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Bertha Calderon from Reckon Parks. Thank you. So tell us about the program this past summer. It was great. Well, some of the highlights included um, serving healthier meals as part of the good food purchasing policy. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited about that. And then also we partnered with LAUSD, first time we've done that. So that was really great. Yeah. And then um, we were also able to receive a grant from the National Park and Recreation Association for $25,000 to provide nutrition education to 10 recreation centers mm -hmm. throughout the city. So that was really great. And do you think you'll have that same resource next summer? I don't know yet. Um, we probably won't know until next year sometime, right? We won't know, yeah. but the uh, NRPA is such a good partner. They will, if that funding is available, contact us, and we'll certainly reach out to them to uh, apply again. What I loved is the fact that <clears throat> There wasn't a gap between the meals, you know, the, the, the good, square, healthy meal that was served at a school and then eight weeks of you know, no school. And then since we're back on traditional track in, in all of the 13th, and, but maybe arguably most of the city now, we're back on right. traditional track, it provides a different challenge, and that is eight weeks of a resource that is lacking. We were able to keep that gap feel, filled this summer. 
that was a wonderful thing. So right. we want to not just bring it back, but grow it. That's the that's the goal. Uh, anything to add to that? Just that. You waited this whole meeting <laughs> to talk about this great program. Thank you. It was just, um, yeah, yeah. It's good, right? I mean, we're also increasing the traffic at our recreation park facilities. We're feeding these kids who need access to a healthy meal mm -hmm. all summer long. It's like one of the greatest programs, I think. Thank you for your support. Terrific. Well, thank you, Ms. Calderon. Thank you, uh, Ms. Atkinson for your great work, Thank and uh, we'll do everything in our power to not just bring it back, but expand it next summer. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And before we adjourn, we do have one general public comment. Uh, someone else who waited the whole time, and that's uh, Kathleen Sullivan. Maybe she didn't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a general public comment. Kathleen Sullivan, going once, going twice. And that concludes Arts Parks.